everybody to the Western webinar organized by Facial Manipulation Institute uh, by Stecco. Uh, today, it's a great pleasure to introduce you uh, with the topic Dysmenorrhea Managing the Monster or Teaming the Monster, uh, Dr. Colin Whiteford. All right. Well, thank you, Carmela. And thank you everybody for being here, joining in on a busy day, work day here in the middle of the afternoon. Um, I'm excited to have this opportunity to share this presentation. You see the slide the way you do because I just gave this presentation at the American Physical Therapy Association combined sections meeting. It was just last week in San Antonio, Texas. And we talked about this topic. I've shortened it and I'm gonna have to shorten it even a little more because time is uh, going fast here. So thank you to the Fashion Manipulation Association for giving me this opportunity. I want to thank you for joining, but I also want to thank the women who were willing to share their story so that I could have some evidence in this uh, presentation of how this really works in the clinic. And I, I really appreciate them sharing their stories. I had to cut my story out of the presentation because it, it just got too long. But anyway, so what, what I was hoping to accomplish with choosing this topic was just to increase awareness of how prevalent these disorders are, menstrual disorders, the burden that they impose, the complications that can develop when they're not managed globally and comprehensively, of the multitude of treatment options that there are for them, and how important early intervention is in their management. So you already heard a lot about me. The only thing I want to share is there's my email. Um, it's a great way if anybody wants to reach out to me. And I'm in the United States with my husband. We have four clinics that we share with other partners in two states. And I have a website that's fearfully, wonderfully made dot life. And it's loaded with information on fascia, fascia manipulation. I use it to explain to patients a lot of why I'm treating and how we're treating so that they can participate in their care. And so I don't have to spend my whole treatment time trying to educate them on why we're doing what we're doing. So please feel free to go there. You can sign up and you'll get an update every time I have an opportunity to post on it. So if we're gonna talk about this, I like to define things. Dysmenorrhea actually only refers to the pain aspect of menstruation and the pain and cramping aspect. It was never my intent to be so limiting, um, but that was just the topic I chose. But actually when you look at all the problems associated with menstrual disorders, there's a, there's a host of names that describe really they're related to symptomology. So this system of nomenclature is based on just the symptoms. And a lot of these are coexist, like dysmenorrhea often occurs also with hypermenorrhea. And I think it's because a lot of what's driving these problems is also overlapping. And so the treatment approaches are also very similar for all of them, as far as I'm concerned in my clinic. So that's why this talk really isn't just gonna be about dysmenorrhea, it's gonna be about all of these menstrual disorders. And if I could change the title of it, I would, but too late for that. So it was in November, 2020, the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology remarkably dedicated 40 pages of this journal to talking about menstruation and menstrual disorders. And one of the things they had to say was that women's health concerns are generally underrepresented in research and especially when it comes to reproductive health and basic physiology, which is rather remarkable at this time. So they proposed a different way of classifying these disorders, and they, they presented three struck concepts for how we might classify. Instead of it being based on that earlier list where it's all about symptoms, this is more looking at three possible ways to organize it as a structural cause for a menstrual disorder, as a non-structural, and then as a not otherwise classified. The problem that I see with this is similar to in orthopedics where people are looking for something on an MRI or an X-ray to explain somebody's shoulder pain or knee pain or back pain, and it doesn't always correlate. You can't always find a correlation or it just doesn't line up with the clinical presentation. And I would suggest that that is potentially a problem with looking at this construct as well. But nonetheless, it's a good effort to try to bring more organization to it. We're gonna be talking today probably what would be considered under the category of not otherwise classified because I'm gonna be talking a lot about the connective tissues and their role. So we really should look at what's normal versus abnormal. I mean, you really have to sort of know what your, what your 
definition of it is so that you can identify then, well, is this a normal problem or is it, is it just an abnormality? First, let's talk about the pain aspect of the menstrual cycle and dysmenorrhea. Um, a lot of women that I see that if they sought help, if they went and saw a practitioner for their problems with their menstrual cycle, they're often told that it's normal, that maybe the pain that they're experiencing is just normal and it's typical for women to have that kind of pain. I find that very remarkable because I don't think we really do that with orthopedic disorders like telling a, a shoulder pain patient that their pain is normal or their knee pain is normal. Um, it's, it's such a varied construct that I don't know how we can really say what's normal and what's not. Um, and on that note, I really did try to find when does somebody cross from being a normal menstrual cycle into dysmenorrhea, a painful menstrual cycle, and there really wasn't any kind of guideline for how do we determine which category they're in. So I decided I'd make up my own. And so I say that abnormal would be pain that's present throughout the majority of the day and continues for more than two to three days. Pain that requires frequent, repeated, and high doses of medication is not normal. And thirdly, pain that debilitates the sufferer, disrupting work, school, sports, social events, other activities of daily living. To me, these are not normal, and the presence of any or all of these really warrants attention and further investigation. So what's normal bleeding? Well, this is a little bit easier to identify because it's not such an abstract construct as pain. Literature says on average six to eight teaspoons of blood or roughly a little bit under the, the two U.S. shot glasses. And I didn't realize that different countries have different size shot glasses. I thought it was the same all over. The Mayo Clinic proposes this sort of standard to determine it, what's normal and what's abnormal when it comes to bleeding. And you can see these, soaking through one or more pad or tampon, needing to use double protection, waking up at night, bleeding longer than a week, plots that are larger than a quarter, restricting daily activities, as I had mentioned earlier, and other symptoms as well. You know, menstrual disorders are absolutely nothing new. They date back to the dawn of time. And this is an artist's depiction from the Gospel of Mark. And the story was about a woman who'd had a hemorrhage for 12 years. Now, it doesn't say specifically that she had problems with her menstrual cycle, but I don't have a problem assuming that's what the hemorrhage was about. And in that society and in that day and time, you were ostracized and considered unclean and unfit to be around other people. She had no life for 12 years. And the story goes that she spent a lot of money, time, and effort pursuing treatments from physicians that only made her worse. Sometimes things don't change over time. Aristotle viewed menstruation as a sign of a woman's inferiority and perhaps as a, a perspective that persists even to today. These two books just represent very different takes on it. The Curse from 1988, you can tell by the title what the perspective on menstruation is there. And this 1970 book, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, had a, had a very positive spin on it. I remember I read this as a young girl and Margaret, um, her family took her out to dinner and they celebrated the onset of her period. So all kinds of perspectives out there. So why should we talk about this taboo topic that you just don't sit around at cocktail parties talking about? Well, I would suggest number one reason is it's very prevalent. The research shows dysmenorrhea is considered the most common symptom of all complaints, and it poses a greater burden of disease than any other gynecological complaint. It says in developing countries, but I would suggest it goes beyond developing countries. It's all over the world. It's just what they looked at in this article. This 2006 article from the British Medical Journal cites the prevalence estimates as varying between 45 to 95 percent of women, regardless of age or nationality. And the reason there's such a variance, 45 to 95 percent is a huge span, but I think it stems from problems defining when does somebody really have dysmenorrhea and when is it just considered a normal amount of pain and dysfunction with their cycle. I know this prevalence is reflected in my practice. Some of the women that I see come to me directly because they have menstrual disorders, and many of them come for some other reason associated with pain, which we're gonna look at a little bit later. But I always ask about this because I'm always looking for past medical history that may play into how I treat them today, right now, whatever their problem presentation is. It's remarkable how often when you ask about it, that a woman will cite dysmenorrhea or menstrual disorders as being the very first problem she ever recalls experiencing. 
There are risk factors that you can see here that are associated with a higher prevalence of having dysmenorrhea if any of these or multiple of these factors are present. So another reason that we should talk about this, this taboo topic is the burden that it imposes. In 1919, a woman could be expected to have 40 menstrual cycles basically because of childbearing and breastfeeding. In 2019, because of lifestyle changes and the use of birth control measures, a woman can be expected to experience 400 menstrual cycles in her life. The burden is also represented in productivity loss. This can be from somebody calling in and not being present at work or being present at work but not being able to be as productive just because of the distraction with the whole dysmenorrhea and menstrual cycle disorders. There's also a, a tangible dollar cost associated with it. Um, sanitary products are not cheap, and I was actually surprised that it was only $13.25 a month, according to this study, that's U.S. dollars. Um, in some regions and localities, sanitary products are taxed as a luxury item, and the same as a tobacco or cigarette, and they're not really considered a medical necessity. They're just taxed differently, which I find rather abominable. Um, more from this article, the same article, for tens of millions of women around the world, menstruation regularly and often catastrophically disrupts their physical, mental, and social well-being. And that was the case for Tammy. She's a patient of mine, and she might be watching, and I appreciate her willingness to let me share her story. But you can see here, she had very high levels of pain, and it was rather debilitating for her. We're going to try to play the video that I recorded with her. Um, I've always had, um, I've always cramp, had cramping, cramping, cramping. Um, even as a teenager, but I would say after the birth of both of my children, especially my, my second, my daughter, it got progressively worse to the point that leading up to it and even in the first day, um, I would have pain so bad that I would shake. It, it kind of made me shaky. Um, I would have to live on ibuprofen. Um, didn't want to move. It was, it really... It really put me down for about 24 to 48 hours. And so every month I would just like brace for impact because I knew it was going to be bad. And um, sometimes I was able to work from home um, because the only way to be comfortable was just to put a heaving pad on it or lay down, um, not move. That was the other thing. If I wasn't moving, there was no pain. Um, and there's, I thought it was normal, but I had an intensely large amount of clotting, blood clotting. Um, so I was just like, okay, this is what it is. As you get older, I thought maybe I was moving into menopause. Is this a part of it? I don't know. I just assumed that this was normal and <laughs> that's what most of women deal with until I talked to you and you said, no, that's not normal. And then I realized, oh, maybe there's a lot more going on here than I originally thought. So that's what led to that conversation. So why this topic? The third reason, complications. Complications are a big one. So short-term complications for a young girl, you can see the list here. And I want you to note that at the bottom, there's a predisposition to chronic pain. And chronic pain doesn't mean you've had it a long, long time. Chronic pain has to do with brain changes and sensitivity and things like allodynia and, and um, just abnormal responses to normal stimulus. Long-term complications, I see a lot of this in my practice and it's, it's heartbreaking because these are complicated things to try to reverse and improve. It's much harder when it gets to this point. A lot of these women have surgery for, for any or all of these. And at the bottom of this, you can see also chronic pain, again, is a real risk for development with long-term complications of dysmenorrhea. This study looked at the link between dysmenorrhea and the development of chronic pelvic pain. They found that 16% of the women that, the women that they were following developed chronic pelvic pain in one year, 50% developed it within 12 years. And the timeline varied greatly, you know, plus or minus eight years out of nine total years. That means you developed it within the first year of having a dysmenorrhea. Um, so it's really important to recognize and address it in the adolescent age. This study looked at associations between suicide, the risk of suicide being higher for women with PMS and what's called premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And they also cited that there's really a lack of research on this topic compared with other psychiatric disorders. 
this is a, a, just a snippet. I don't, I had an interview with her, but I'm going to just skip it um, for Brooke, who came to us. This is her with her, her therapist was Victoria in our office. She came to us pregnant and it, she had low back pain and lower extremity cramping. It was her first pregnancy. And she was terrified of complications that she might experience related to us. She related lifelong issues with her bladder, dysmenorrhea that put her on birth control at age 13. Then she started having problems after that with DVT, you know, thrombosis, and she was put on a blood thinner. Problems continued for her. Her therapy was interrupted because she had to be put on rest, and we resumed her therapy just a few weeks before she delivered. We were scrambling, trying to cover all that we needed to cover to try to make her as ready to have this baby as she could be. Unfortunately, things didn't go very well. The labor was stalled, they induced, and she finally underwent an emergency C-section. Fortunately, baby and mom are okay, but I just have to wonder if we just could have intervened sooner, could we have made all this go any better for her and the baby? Another story of complications, long-term complications, same story, dysmenorrhea for Cindy at age 13, heavy bleeding, cramping. She tried multiple birth control measures. She had problems tolerating them. It didn't work for her. She gave it up. Fast forward 21 years later, all these other problems are developing. It didn't go away. It gets worse. And she finally sought some help when the urinary incontinence as well as her musculoskeletal issues were just becoming unlivable for her. So I really would suggest that time doesn't heal all wounds. And oftentimes it only makes things worse and the complications just build on each other. And it's a shame because I think that if we would just look earlier at this in these young girls, we might be able to prevent some of these problems instead of scrambling in the aftermath to try to help manage them. And maybe that's what we were doing here with little Emma. Her mom was my patient. And as we talked about her past and her childhood problems with her legs, she recognized the same thing in her daughter who would come and wake her up at night because her legs were hurting. So she brought little Emma in. We did a visit with instruction on how they could follow through at home. And they're continuing to work on that to try to keep her from going into the same problems, perhaps that her mom has developed. So why this taboo topic? We really can help it. It's very responsive to proper care. So Chris Lynn was 33. Her primary complaint was lower back pain, and she had a trauma in the military and a fusion in 2015, but she continued to have lower back pain. This was her menstrual history. She had severe cramping, bleeding. She was put on birth control, but it really didn't resolve the problem. Here's this history again, first child, emergency C-section. You start to see a pattern in practice. And her second child, she was able to deliver vaginally, which is a miracle really, but she had ongoing problems with bleeding and cramping and things were just getting worse. And she went back on birth control, but it didn't, it didn't make much difference for her. So I saw her then, and the first visit that I had with her consisted of cupping, as well as education on how to use a cupping kit and what she might get out of a percussion device for treating her fascia on a home program because I knew with my schedule, I couldn't get her in again. It was gonna be a while. So this is what she said after that first visit. So I'm here with Chrislyn Romano and it's her second visit, she's returning. And why don't you tell us how you did after your first visit, which was about three weeks ago. After my first visit, I had my period for the first time after using the cupping and some manual compression on my stomach, which helped tremendously, surprisingly. Uh, things that were as simple as using a tampon didn't seem quite as painful. Um, and not doing some of the therapy actually caused more pains than was necessary. I guess I should just keep up with it. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so you, you got a cupping kit and you're using that. You used it where? Uh, on my legs and my abdomen. Yeah, okay. And uh, that was a little uncomfortable for you because you were hitting some hot spots. But Correct. for the most part, you did pretty good with that. Yes. Okay, and then you, where'd you use the percussion? Uh, uh, normally just on my legs. Just on the legs. Yes. Great. Okay, so you didn't even take that to your abdomen. No. <laughs> okay, good. So... Did you have, let's see, was there, it was mostly pain was better with your period? Yes. Okay, what about, um, yeah, cramping was better and you, did you have to use as much medication? No. 
Not Good. at all. Not at all. That's awesome. And you usually use what Midol? Yes. Tylenol. Tylenol leave. <laughs> okay. And any was there any other change with it? Okay. What about the like the flow? Were you still did you bleed real heavily or no? Actually, it was lighter. Awesome. That's great. <laughs> okay. Well, let's get to work here. We got a lot to do. Thank you. Thank you. All that with one visit, and we're continuing to work with her and move move through more of her fascial problems. So that was nice to hear. This is Brittany. Let's see. She. Um, this is what she had to say. Before having the baby, uh, my menstrual cycles were extremely painful um, before and at the start of them to the point where I would have to call out of work. Like everyone be able, would be able to tell that I was on my cycle just by the way I looked and carried myself. So um, had the baby 10 months ago, almost 11 months ago now, had my first two cycles and the pain is like, I don't even have to take a painkiller before I would have to be on painkillers like leading up to and all during um, my cycle because the cramping would be so bad. Um, but I haven't had to take anything at the beginning um, or during this last one. Um, and it only lasted for like four or five days instead of like a whole week like it did before. That's pretty neat to hear. And I hear that a lot. So let's take a look at some anatomy and physiology that might explain some of what we're doing and why we're getting the result that we are. So this was a nice study out of the Pelvic Perinology Journal and done by the Italian Research Group, uh, where they looked at just the link between the pelvic floor and the abdominals, the lower back trunk regions, and the lower limb. And they really identified it as a whole body fascial linkage that might explain some of the referred pain that happens with people. This article supported that very construct, that there's a relationship between pelvic motion and the, and the deep fascia, as well as into the calf. And that might explain some of these images from Travell and Simons that many of us are very familiar with, but seeing these referral patterns, it may be a, really a reflective of this fascial network as well, that there's a relationship between that calf and that lower back pelvic region. Dr. Carlos Deco from the University of Padova in Italy has done lots of research and great studies and has was uh, participating in this fascia research online summit that I participated in as well. I watched, I wasn't a presenter. And she talked about the relationship. Could the neuromuscular system interact with the, the viscera, the internal organs? And she proposed three constructs for the, that relationship. The first was the points of fixation through ligaments and anchorages. And I explained this to patients as, you know, your, your organs are not just free agents in your trunk. They are attached to each other through the fascia, which this picture is showing. But then in turn, they're also attached to the trunk wall at very specific points. And these are some of the points that we work on with fascia manipulation because they are very influential potentially on the underlying organ that's attaching itself to the trunk wall at that point. A second point that she brought up in this relationship between myofascia and internal organs is the concept of the container and the contents. I really like this picture of a water balloon. I think it's a, a very simple but, but um, profound way to demonstrate this. So you can imagine this, the water balloon could be the bladder, it could be the colon, it could be the uterus, it could be any hollow organ that's, that's gotta be elastic and expandable as volume changes. It has to be able to expand and contract as the volume of the inside contents changes. But what that bottom picture is demonstrating is if like you put a rubber band over that organ, it's the same as if the fascia is restrictive and it's lost its, its slide and its elasticity at that point. It's going to change the organ. It's, sh it's changing the shape of the water balloon and it's going to have a similar kind of impact on the underlying organ. The organ's not the problem. It's the environment that the, the organ is trying to function in. And I look at that too, when I look at that bottom picture, I think about the two halves of the rectus abdominis and the linea alba being the rubber band in the middle. I can see how if there's a rigidity in that, that linea alba, that rubber band in the middle, it could be why we end up with a split or the diastasis rectus that's often accompanying, but not always pregnancy. And this article in the Journal of Body Work talked specifically to that about the relationship between the internal rectus fascia and the transversus abdominis and how crucial it is that these layers be able to slide 
and maintain elasticity so that as volume expands, they can, to they can tolerate that and accommodate it. Also from Antonio Stecco and his group, the same magazine, they're looking at the relationship between the pectoral fascia and how it's this seamless continuity all the way down into the pelvis, but also that layered formation that has to have that slide and that elasticity. It's crucial for the underlying organs. And this brings us to the third point of, of Dr. Stecco's concept of container and contents being part of the relationship between the myofascial and the internal organ system. So you can think about it like, like a bridge, okay? Like our, the road deck is there and there's the bridge and the support cables. The trunk is like the road deck. We've got the organs inside and the road deck should support cars, but this bridge isn't gonna work. It's going to fall down as soon as you start loading the deck because you need that outside support maintaining tension on that middle support. And it's the same thing with maintaining the space of the trunk or what we call the canister to keep things open and maintain the integrity of the trunk so that the internal organs can have a good, normal functioning environment. And if you superimpose the body on that, you can see the tensor, there's a proximal one for the arms. The distal tensor is the one that's really important when we're talking about dysmenorrhea because it's in the lower half of the body and it has a strong relationship with the pelvic segment. So again, the problem is not the organ. That's why so many tests come out negative because they're looking at the organ. The problem is the environment it's trying to function in. Now I've sort of alluded to the sliding system and I'll only spend a second on this one. So many of us are familiar with hyaluronic acid or hyaluronin being the lubricant that allows fascia to slide and give space between layers. And when it becomes dysfunctional, it can become adherent and space occupying so that we lose vital space and we lose elasticity. These are places, if you looked at a, a slice from the skin at the top down to the muscle at the bottom, these are places where hyaluronin is very important and where it's also found as this slide shows. So hyaluronin is gonna stain that dark deep blue and it's shown all over our connective tissues, but there are places where it's especially important. And that picture on the left is showing it in the aponeurotic fascia. So some of what can go wrong with it, it just becomes overloaded. It becomes um, entangled on itself. And instead of being a space creating lubricating agent, it becomes a space occupying adherent agent that makes the layers stick together and you lose elasticity. This is not just from one article. This is from three different articles in the literature that are supporting what I just said about that elasticity and that ability to expand is very important. The low back pain in the, in the slides on the left and showing hypoechoic and stiff nodules with um, ultrasound imaging on the top right. And then in the bottom with Stecco and his group showing that the chronic neck patients had changes in their fascia compared to the group that didn't have neck pain. Again, back to this, just another way to show this. A is what we want, space and the ability to slide. B is what happens when we compromise that and the tissues become overloaded and what's called densified. So people always ask, how does this happen? And my elevator answer is always overload. The poor little donkey is overloaded. And these are the things that we believe overload the tissues. Injury, like a car accident, but also even an ankle sprain, remembering how important the ankle segment, the lower limb is for dysmenorrhea and menstrual disorders. Repetitive movements like stairs or you know, squatting repeatedly. Um, so many things that we do over and over again. Or immobilization, like right now, we're all sitting. And that's a form of immobilization or a cast or even a surgery can impose a, an immobilization. So let's look at a little bit with biochemistry. We already sort of have them. Um, so this was a, a great study, just looking at what kind of hormone receptors are in the fascia. And they found that fascia has estrogen and relaxin hormone receptors. And it looks like this. They looked at three different parts of the body, the rectus sheath, which is the abdomen, the pearl fascia of the calf, and then the, the fascia of the thigh. And they were the first to show that the fibroblasts express sex hormone receptors. And this could be the link between hormonal factors and myofascial pain. Why women may hurt more in general, but why they also may hurt more when they're like moving through their cycle. I have a patient who only gets hip pain when she has her period. 
And I explain, I showed her this and it, it was rather enlightening for her because it was, it was almost confirming that she wasn't crazy. She really did feel that change. So these are some of the proposed mechanisms that would relate dysmenorrhea to chronic pain that we have peripheral and central sensitization changes in the brain, even especially when an adolescent is experiencing dysmenorrhea, chronic pain for years, you're going to start to get changes in the brain itself. Another study showing that allodynia is present. So that's, that would be a painful response to a non-painful stimulus. He was touching the cute the abdomen of these women with dysmenorrhea with a Q-tip, and they were cringing and reporting levels of pain. It's because they've been in pain for so long, you start to get sensitized overly. I threw this in just to take a look at, um, maybe it would explain why allodynia in part might develop, is because if you look to the left, the skin has that black triangle. It had the, the highest number of nerves in it of any of these tissues that were looked at. From, from live samples, from surgical samples. So all these layers that we've been talking about, they all have nerves in them. The skin had the highest. And maybe that's why there can be such sensitivity in the skin, but maybe that's why too that girl, Chrislin, had a really good response when I cupped her because we, we opened up pathways for these nerves that might've been clogged in the skin. So I wanna talk just a second about movement. You know, there's too much and there's too little and we want it just right in the middle. But too much or too little can stimulate pro-inflammatory biochemicals in the body that can lead to pain. In my practice, I see a lot of hypermobility. And a lot of the women that I see who have menstrual disorders also have hypermobility. And this study showed a link that 80, almost 83% of those who have some form of hypermobility also had gynecological problems. And I want to point this out. This is Tammy, the one that I shared the interview with earlier. Restrictions can happen even in a hypermobile individual. And that's when they can be especially problematic. So I want to share a little bit on interventions. Um, these were just some fun pictures. This was a, a, from a meat packing plant. They sold this elixir that was for menstrual disorders, among other things. On the right, that was an ad from 1893 for the electropathic belt. And it was for ladies' ailments, among other things. I'm sure that was interesting. Um, Mygol, 1911, first a toothache and headache remedy. And of course, the market just expanded. And I like this picture. I, I think he better watch out. She looks like she wants to grab that ping pong paddle and smack him in the head with it. But fortunately, she makes a good choice. And there's lots of medications on the market now that deal with menstrual disorders. Lots of ideas on the internet about all different things you can do. But Usually the go-to is hormone manipulation through one form or another. And the literature supports that. I mean, this is from American Family Physician. Hormonal contraceptives are the first line treatment and anti-inflammatory drugs as well. And they do a good job, but I would suggest it's an incomplete approach. We really need to look at the whole person. And there's a lot more that can be done for these women and girls than just medications of hormone or otherwise. So exercise, the literature supports that good exercise can be very helpful for improving the symptoms of dysmenorrhea and other menstrual disorders. The um, exercise has to be metered properly, though. A lot of adolescents believe that it's perfectly normal for them to lose their period as they train, and that would be a sign of their dosing their exercise wrong. There really needs to be conversation, too, that things may need to be modified according to where a woman is in the menstrual cycle. Maybe this is why women have such high episodes of, of ACL tear and why they repeat them so often. Exercises too, just for specific stretching and strengthening can be good. I have a few that I pull out and these are just three that I like to share. Um, dry needling, I have found to be very effective. Two articles here showing it on the abdomen um, and they had very nice response with pain relief. This is showing Cumulatively, they saw 12 people, and these were all the sites that they treated. Not on each person, but I mean, all of them put together are shown here. And I'm going to talk about a little bit more about that picture in a moment. Um, this was a nice article out of Italy from Andre Pisini. He saw for one visit a young lady with um, menstrual pain that required a lot of medication, and she also had knee pain. He saw her and treated her with fascia manipulation. 
working at these points and had a very nice response. It abolished her pelvic pain and it improved her knee pain significantly and it, that was sustained at follow-up. This is another article out of Poland about a woman who had uh, back pain after she had a child and that it was exacerbated with these activities. So this, I made this timeline up because the timeline's important in the fascia manipulation model. And for this young gal, she had um, onset of problems when she had braces put on and began with bruxism. But you can see the development of her problems over time that, that it's continuing to worsen and these other things aren't getting resolved because she was still complaining of them. So she was seen for four sessions and they worked on, this is just one visit, but I couldn't fit them all in here. Uh, they worked on the deep fascia. And then where you see those oblong shapes, they worked on the hypodermis with some more superficial techniques. And they also taught her how to work on her episiotomy scar. And it, I think it's good to point out that they worked in her head and that was her area of oldest problems. So even though she was coming from all these other things for all these other complaints, they spread out and did a global approach on her, which I believe made it very successful. And you can see her response to treatment here that her numbers made very nice improvement. Dysmenorrhea reduced from an eight to a two. That's very nice. And follow-ups, it was sustained. So they were hypothesizing that the dysmenorrhea resulted from myofascial tension and the episiotomy star just made it worse. So a lot of people wanna know how are these points determined? Even though I'm going back to a little bit of anatomy, I thought this was a good place to interject this just very briefly, lots of dissection and careful dissection, meticulous, preserving the integrity of the fascia so we can learn about it. Also from, this is a one figure from Luigi Stecco's book on the Atlas of the Physiology of the Muscular Fascia, basically just recalling the monosynaptic reflex arc and how that works in the body. And what we know about it is that when we wanna move in a certain direction, we don't get an all or none contraction from a muscle. And it's not just one muscle but we get contraction of the muscle spindles that are necessary to make movement happen in a certain direction and even at a certain velocity, but they're in different muscles and they're not whole muscle and they have to be coordinated or, or the movement will not happen properly and seamlessly and smoothly. And so what, what the theory is that all these motor units converge on a single point that coordinates this movement and that's where we get these points. And this is showing it in the segment of retrotalus in the, in the back of the calf. So when, you, when we look at this, this picture doesn't go with this article, but this is referring back to the one that I showed earlier. You know, in that article, they talked about needling myofascial trigger points. But I look at that as a fascial manipulation person. I see, I see anti-medial in there. I see anti-lateral and I see intra. And I dare say, if an acupuncturist looked at this, they would probably be identifying meridians. But it's interesting how we're all sort of identifying very effective points to be working on people, but we're just coming at it from different perspectives. So in the article by Langevin and colleagues, um, they, they just refer back to acupuncture as being what relates the surface of the body to the internal organs. And isn't that kind of what I was talking about earlier? They're talking about a network that represents the interstitial connective tissue, as we've been talking about, and that the connective tissue cleavage planes, which I'll show you a, a cut of in a moment, is where acupuncture points are often found. And this is an image from that article where they showed, you can see the AP, is that's an acupuncture point, where there's a cleavage between the vastus lateralis and the biceps femoris in the back of the thigh, whereas the control point that they just picked randomly has no such cleavage, and that's not where an acupuncture point is. And I would say a lot of our fascia manipulation points are also at these intermuscular junctures or cleavages. And they are not just at one level, but they continue and are followed all the way down the kinetic chain and up the kinetic chain so that there's this seamless continuity that lets us work on somebody's head when we're trying to help their pelvis or why we need to be down in their foot or calf to help dysmenorrhea. So Tammy said this, I didn't get it on recording, and so I'm holding her to her word and I'm making her a poster child. And I wanna run through her care real quick. She came to me primarily for right hip pain. That was her main complaint. Her oldest problem was dysmenorrhea and she couldn't remember anything further back. And you'd already heard her talk about the problems that she had with her cycle. 
So I take her to my website. I teach, I turn people over to this. So they'll read about fascia, fascia manipulation and other tools that I want them to understand. I give a lot of educational materials and I shared these with her. She was hypermobile. And here, then I did movement assessment on her. Now she had limitations in her squat. And remember it was her right hip that was her main complaint that brought her to me, but her left hip was the one harboring the restriction. So I assessed her with palpation at these access points in the hip. I assessed the pelvic segment because of her dysmenorrhea. And I also assessed her ankle because she had a history of sprains, but also because I'm looking at that distal tensor. What I found was the horizontal plane, a recurrent theme in all these segments that showed up in that plane. So this is showing one point. You're just seeing it from two views. I treated one point in her right pelvis called intrapelvi. And then even though this is showing the right leg, I treated it on the left side. I treated intratalus. So one point on the right pelvis, one point in the left leg. I use my elbow and percussion, but this is just demonstrating that deep fascia that we're trying to restore slide to. And this was her before treatment. This was her after treatment. And I think she got some nice gains in her mobility there. Her squat shows even more of a gain before and after treatment. So this is what she said after that one treatment. This time again, it didn't wake me up from the pain. It just woke me up because I could tell my body was getting ready to move into a menstrual cycle. Um, and so I, I went to the bathroom and took care of things and I went back to bed and I thought, hmm, I didn't have to take ibuprofen this time. Um, I could tell that I was on my period and there was some pain, but it was so minimal in comparison to even a month prior. Now, throughout the day, um, it did get a little, a little more painful and I did have to take ibuprofen, but it was only once. I took it once the entire day. And then I actually worked out the next day, which was not, is not common. I would usually take two or three days off of my workout every month um, just because I would be that uncomfortable. Um, so in closing, I just want to say, I think this is urgent. Um, and these people also recognize it as, as such. This is from a 2013 paper they wrote on primary dysmenorrhea. And these were some of the comments that I extracted. They said, given that primary dysmenorrhea affects a quarter of the human reproductive age population, the paucity of studies concerning this condition is disgraceful. I would agree. They also said, you know, our current minimal understanding of this may be somewhat influenced by our society and our clinical attitudes toward it and that we're really looking at it as being not very significant. And they closed with this. In other words, dysmenorrhea must no longer be dismissed. And I would say menstrual disorders in general no longer need to be dismissed. So I wanna thank you for hanging with me. And I wanna thank my co-presenter at Combined Sections meeting, that was Cecily DeStefano. I don't know if she's on here or not today. And I appreciate Brent Harper, he gave us content contributions. He couldn't be with us in the presentation uh, when we were in Texas, but thank you all for attending. I hope you got something out of it and I hope you can see how important it is that we really consider this in our treatment model for women. And uh, now we have uh, different um, questions for you by uh, our colleague. Uh, the first is uh, by Annie. Uh, can you uh, tell us something about FMHID uh, and endometriosis? Yeah, that's a really good question. People get really freaked out and afraid when somebody's got endometriosis and they think, ooh, it's this big disease. I had one instructor in a pelvic course I was at, she said, endometriosis is like the osteoarthritis of gynecology. If you think about that, what she's saying is, <laughs> It's, it's kind of the, 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 we blame everything on it. Um, but the studies show that you can have women who have endometriosis and they don't have any problems with infertility. They don't have any problems with pain. And then you have women who have pain and they have infertility and they don't have endometriosis. But when the two are together, we automatically blame the endometriosis. And then oftentimes all that takes you to is surgery and a laparoscopic procedure, hopefully, to address the endometriosis. But I see so many of these women who went that route and they didn't get any improvement from it. And I also see a lot of women who we change, we can change polyps 
We can change fibroids and we can change endometriosis. Remember what I said about it's not the organ that's the problem. If you change that environment that 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 dis, that organ that's now struggling is trying to exist in, you can change a lot of these these structural problems that are are considered to be primary, but I, I think they're really just a reflection of the of the fascial environment that is disrupting normal function of the organ. Yes, I think that uh, there is this uh, uh, strict relationship, and also in uh, in this pathology, in this this is is important uh, the role of uh, uh, the treatment of uh, the fascia because uh, there is also the continuity, and it's obvious we cannot uh, resolve the problem if there is an organic problem, but in the functionally uh, point of view, functional point of view, we can uh, we can change uh, uh, a lot of things. But we have other uh, other question in capping application. Do you follow myofascial points uh, CC and CFs? Um, well, they're usually in there. Um, but when I'm doing cupping, um, it depends on the person. Uh, I t I really try not to bruise people, and hypermobile people have a tendency to have really soft connective tissue, so they bruise easier. And I find that when I leave a cup stationary. Uh, and I pump very hard, they're going to have a higher tendency to bruise. Having said that, if I'm on a point like lateral genu uh, or a really stubborn, painful CC, probably more than a CF, it's hard to get some of these to uh, the cups to stay around a joint as well. But on a CC, I might leave the cupping still for a little bit, or I might um, put several cups on and just keep kind of putting them on, taking them off around the CC, but I also cup very broadly thinking about the quadrant and I'm trying to address that, that whole um, hypodermis and the superficial fascia in a broader area than just the CC itself. But there's usually CCs in the area and CFs where I'm cupping. So I guess that's yes, yes to yes and yes. <laughs> okay. And uh, we have another by always, is cupping for improvement in superficial fascia or in deep fascia? Oh. Oh, that that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't know that we can necessarily draw a line and say an absolute one way or the other. I I find that if somebody can't tolerate me working the deep fascia, sometimes it's because I overlooked the quadrant and I needed to deal with the more superficial tissue first. So in that sense, if I deal with what's on top, then they may be more tolerant of me working what's underneath. I think sometimes too, the reason the dysfunctions on top might be stemming from the deeper dysfunction, the deep fascia. So I don't think you can necessarily say it's, it's all one or the other, but I don't usually pull out cups it, if it's a deep fascia problem and there's nothing in the superficial or the, or the hypodermis. I don't usually go for cupping on those people. I'll usually just go straight to thinking about deep fascia work. Okay. Okay. But I have uh, my curiosity. Uh, uh, do you start, for example, a trial or other uh, type of experimental uh, design for a research about the dysmenorrhea in uh, with uh, with patient uh, with different centers or not? Ooh. In uh, you were breaking up a lot on my I, and I couldn't hear the question really well. Uh, do you start, uh, do you the idea, have you got the idea to start, for example, uh, uh, a trial, a study uh, about uh, the use of facial manipulation by stack in, uh, uh, in this type of patients? Because I, I think it's really important uh, uh, to, to publish a paper about uh, this topic and uh, with the treatment and uh, uh, by um, facial manipulation stack method. Uh, because uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, they will be very important uh, results. Yeah, oh, I would love to. It's a it's a time and resource issue for me. Um, I've been busy doing presentations <laughs> lately, but I would love to. Do, I, I have a lot of research ideas. I, I and dysmenorrhea and menstrual disorders are are big one because I as I showed they're they're very overlooked in research and, and in the literature. And I think there's a lot that can be done for them. And I know one way to get the word out is to publish. So yeah, absolutely. 
Okay, Colleen, thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, your uh, your speech. It uh, it was really interesting, and it's real uh, interesting uh, the use of the facial manipulation uh, by Steco in this uh, uh, in this disease, but only not only in this, uh, but in the other uh, uh, in the other internal dysfunction that determines organic problems. So for this, uh, uh, thank you so much. I, it, it it was a pleasure uh, to listen uh, your uh, your presentation. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for being here. Thank you. And uh, I want a uh, reminder to our uh, our colleague the next uh, uh, the next event it will be uh, the facial manipulation uh, school with a topic facial manipulation school. 2022-2025 uh, with uh, Professor Antonio Stecco and Professor uh, Carla Stecco and uh, the date uh, is uh, uh, the 9 uh, March at the same uh, at the same time. So uh, see you uh, for uh, the next event uh, in uh, English language and thank you so much for your attention and your availability. See you best tag. Bye bye. bye. <laughs>